Uh, and welcome everybody. My name is Nate Klug and for the last five years or so I have taught poetry uh, at the Center for Arts and Religion at the GTU and uh, I'm really really excited to be here today with uh, my former teacher uh, Peter Cole. Um, let me just read a little biography of Peter um, and then I'll talk uh, for a bit about why we're here today, what we're going to focus on. Um, Peter is one of the foremost Jewish poets and translators in the English speaking world. He was born in 1957 in that famous poetry city of Patterson, New Jersey. And for much of the last four decades, he's lived in Jerusalem. He's the author of five books of poems, many volumes of translations from both Hebrew and Arabic. And his most recent book was Hymns and Qualms, New and Selected Poems and Translations. Um, out from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in 2017. And a new collection is coming out uh, this coming fall, I believe, called Draw Me After. And um, that title caught my eye when I, I saw it online somewhere. And I, I became aware of the connection to this interesting show that um, the Center for Arts and Religion has been um, putting up uh, virtually this whole year. Um, based on the Song of Songs. And so I thought it would be a really interesting kind of constellation and connection um, for us to uh, uh, think about uh, the Song of Songs in relation to uh, Peter's work, uh, past and present. And so we're here today to, um, to celebrate Peter's new book, to hear some poems uh, from that manuscript. And Peter and I are also gonna uh, be in conversation about that particular book from the Bible, uh, one, certainly one of the most interesting texts that I've had the opportunity to interact with, um, and, and also uh, topics like translation, um, spirituality, um, and, and ekphrasis, the, the practice of um, writing after a work of art. Um, so Peter, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be here. It's, it's really good to see you again. Um, I should say too, I got to study with Peter in divinity school and, um, you know, I was at a point in my life where I was really searching for a way to kind of incorporate poetry with my study of the sacred. And Peter was someone who modeled a kind of serious playfulness that, um, I have aspired to in my own poetry and my own relationship with the divine. Um, so it's fun to, to be in conversation. And Peter, I, I wondered if, before we hear a few of your poems, I wondered if um, you might just start by talking to us a little bit about your relationship with the Song of Songs. Um, your new book has an epigraph that, that connects to that text. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, first, it's, it's great to be back in, in conversation with you, Nate. I think about sometimes those, uh, those biweekly sessions of ours under the eaves, and uh, at the end of my long days, and um, the the syllabus that you drew up about it, what well, it was uh, prosody and theology, something like that. And um, it seems like something we should still be doing all the time. Uh, I can I can imagine how that syllabus would would have evolved over the years. Um, so the the book is not is coming out in the fall, so it's not out yet, but. Um, it's called Draw Me After, as Nate said, and that Draw Me After obviously is a line from the Song of Songs, but it's, it means, I almost forget that it's from the Song of Songs. And there was the, the, the notion of, of desire, of wanting to be drawn and be sort of be carried out of oneself and toward other selves uh, um, is so central to what I do as a poet and as a translator, translation being, and poetry really being the same thing for me. Um, so I have to remind myself sometimes, oh yes, right, that is from the Song of Songs. And, and that's in part because the epigraph that you mentioned um, goes like this. Each letter called saying, draw me after you, let us run. Each letter called saying, draw me after you, let us run. And that's from the Zohar, the sort of classical Jewish mystical text um, from Spain, uh, 13th century, um, where the Zohar is, 
it takes the biblical text, the service of the biblical text, and it understands it as just the beginning. It's just a kind of manifest truth, uh, the, the surface of truth that needs to be cracked open in order for sort of the real Torah, the real teaching, the real instruction to be released. And when that surface is cracked open, sort of like a rock or a glass or something, the refraction that, that comes through was really pretty spectacular. And so what the rabbis in this particular section are seeing in that line of, from the Song of Songs where um, the, the woman says to her beloved, draw me after you, let us run, like let, let's go up into the hills. Um, they're seeing the letters of the Hebrew alphabet at the beginning of creation male and female letters different you can think of that in different ways vowels and consonants but they they have their own scheme for what that is that the letters are are, are sort of working out their alignment and their their elective affinities as it were and they're calling to each other draw me after you let us run in other words let's make the world in a sense through language and through this you know infinite possible formation of words so that's an incredibly, you know, when I got to that's an incredibly attractive, dramatic scenario. Uh, it's sort of pre-people, and it's post-people, and it's in people. And um, and then I have to remember, oh, right, right. It's not just about language. It's that's the Song of Songs, too. Um, so there, on the one hand, there's that. There's a kind of linguistic mysticism, the eroticism of language itself, which, you know, as for you, as a poet, for me is is just central to everything I do. Um, so that's on the one hand. Um, and then there's the, the place of song period in the Jewish tradition, which is not something that sort of in mainstream Judaism gets talked about a lot. But in the rabbinic tradition, there actually is a central through line of the centrality of song. All of Jewish history sometimes is seen as a, a sequence of songs beginning with the song, Moses' song at the sea and running up through all of the great hymns of late antiquity and the Middle Ages and the Kabbalistic period and the modern age and up to the Messianic age. That's sort of the one way is you can just chart it all through song. And throughout Jewish writings, there's incredible stuff about the importance of song, the power of song to open the gates to the chariot. The chariot is the America of, uh, uh, Blake writes about things like that. Um, it's basically, I understand that as the chariot, as the vehicle of vision, coming from Ezekiel. Um, and and the word for chariot, Merkava, is very, from the same root in Hebrew as composition. So I envision, I see this as kind of the gate, the vehicle of vision through composition. That's what poetry is for me. And in the same way that the rabbis sort of enjoin, say that um, that song needs to rise up out of Israel. Let's take Israel etymologically as people who struggle with God. That's Jacob and and the angel. Um, that song needs to be renewed each day, like water coming into a well. So all that stuff is incredibly potent, and the song of songs being the best not just the best of all songs, but the song that somehow contains the possibility through those letters being rearranged, the possibility of all song. So that's the kind of magical, mystical tour uh, that's there in it for me. I think my first connection to Song of Songs, if I think back was, I mean, as a child, yes, you get all this kind of, I got all this kind of stuff through Jewish education, but. I think as a poet, it was when I was my first year out of college, I just decided to read through all of, read through the Bible in English. It was the Jewish Publication Society 1917 version. It was a little bit like the revised standard version, let's say. Um, but it was closer, even closer to the King James. And there were all kinds of things there that hit me so hard ling in terms of language, they're still with me, Leviticus, for example. But the, um, the, the passage from, Levit, from Song of Songs 3, I adjure you, O daughters of, the, of Jerusalem, 
by the gazelles and the hinds of the field, that ye, ye awaken not nor stir up love until it please. That hit me so hard. And this thing of, of and the rabbi commentators talk about it as a kind of patience within the mystery and a patience within desire as being so important to whatever kind of eroticism and love and possibility of union um, the Song of Songs is ostensibly all about. So all those things come together and that's my Song of Songs. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, that Zohar quote was so interesting for me to see because it's hard to imagine uh, t taking anything, taking something from the Song of Songs and making it somehow more intense or, or more um, powerful, but that's in a way what that interpretation kind of does by bringing it back to, to, to creation um, and um, kind of inserting it into all of our existence. Exactly, exactly. And you know, let's face it, for, for poets, the surface of the biblical text can be a real problem because where's, I mean, well, you read it, you're, you're a minister, but most people, even if they don't read it and don't know it anymore, they know they don't like it because they've heard it at some level. In other words, as soon as they hear that register, they turn off. Yeah. And, or if they hear it within a religious context, whether it's Jewish or Christian, there's too many preconceived associations. Poetry has to work by surprise. It has to, you know, it constantly has to surprise the language and the reader and the listener. And so it's like, love? Okay, Song of Songs. Like immediately the, um, uh, you know, Wallace Stevens, my favorite uh, line of late is, you know, say what it is that you see in the dark that is that or that is that, that it is this, but do not use the rotted names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to be careful. The, the surface of the Bible for us is a kind of, for poets, I think is easily seen as a kind of rotted name, which is we're too used to it. And so that's what the Zohar does. I think of it sometimes like a Zen garden, you know, raking a Zen garden. It's like the Zohar, the rabbis come along and they just rake the surface of the text. And psh, out comes all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff that's latent in it and it makes it alive again. Of course, the Zohar can then become that thing that needs to be raked too. Uh, sure, sure. No, and that's so often what I think uh, clergy or religious professionals of all stripes are, are struggling with is how to take these old old texts, you know, especially if you're talking to people that have sat through hundreds of sermons or, or messages, you know, how to actually try to bring it alive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Peter, maybe we can hear your first group of poems now. Um, sure. I think Eden's song in particular connects to some of what we've been talking about. So Nate asked me to share a screen and show the, um, so you can see these poems as I read them. And um, so I'll just read this first one and we can talk about it a little bit and how it relates to all those things I've been talking about, song, um, Eden, uh, song of songs, Eden song. Wanting song in the beginning, beginning to end. Now we are falling through what's to come. Needing Eden, now we are drifting, Eden undone. As if from the ends of earth hearing Eden's calling to tend and attend. Now we are sprawling through what we've done, through what we're losing, as what we've won. As we are falling, as Eden is calling, earth and heaven wanting song. So maybe in the background of a poem like this, there's a sense of, um, which is also something you find in the Zohar, that um, the world begins with a desire for song. The rabbis actually take the words in the beginning and read it anagrammatically as desiring song. Hmm. And that, that the world begins with that impulse to song. And I always annoy all of my fiction writer friends um, by saying that uh, 
Everybody says you can't live without stories. I can't live without song. Right? That for me, that's what you know. That's what lifts me. Um, no, I f I feel the same way. I think that's that's not what our culture tells itself so often. Um, there seems to be this need to place everything in a narrative frame, maybe a confessional frame, and you know, maybe people would say like Protestantism has a lot to to do with that, with its whole emphasis on you know spiritual kind of conversion narratives. Um, but but song kind of and this poem takes us back to a more I don't know primordial basic um, place. Um, and so it's interesting to hear that rabbinical um, interest in, in anagrams and shifting letters around. Um, and that's part of what you're doing here in this poem. I think everybody probably noticed that as you followed along, um, you know, and, and the relate the close relationship, right. Of words like Eden with, with end and, um, tend, attend, um, of course the word Eden has, has, um, need <laughs> hidden in it. Um, so I guess I'd be curious, Peter, to just like hear a little bit about your practice as a poet with relationship to anagram. Are you someone who, do you kind of see these things? Or, you know, do you see these relationships kind of everywhere? Yeah, it's a um, bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. Especially when everybody's looking for the narrative. <laughs> I'm going yeah. off at 11 o'clock. Um, so, first of all, the way, uh, obviously, someone like you sees these right away, and um, that's, that's back to that epigram, right, that the letters are calling to each other, and it's as if the words themselves contain their own future or their own future evolution, and they lead to other words and to union between words and then between multiple words, and um, that's, in a sense, it's almost as if the words themselves contain the desire to be beyond themselves and to be connected to a larger matrix, um, which comes very much, as I say, out of that, that epigram, um, uh, epigraph. And I, yeah, I hear, I'm always joking with my wife about this kind of thing with, uh, I, I just hear ambiently when people talk um, and, and so often miss what they're saying. <laughs> like I think of it myself as a good listener, but I'm not necessarily listening to what I'm supposed to be listening to. I mean, you could try to do them both at once, ideally, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, but that makes, the, that makes language just, makes the world incredibly interesting for me. Um, that there, there are these possibilities, these kind of polyvalent possibilities just floating around all the time. Um, and it gives, it's a source of deep pleasure and there's kind of unconscious stuff going on in it too. And so in terms of process, um, you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know anymore. Uh, in a way uh, my writing has become more and more reliant on that kind of desire that sort of, how did you put it? Uh, um, not primary, but, um, yeah, primordial. The primordial, yeah. So, like, like the Edenic sense of the Edenic. What's one of the one of the ways of looking at Eden is that's a place where those things can happen. You love Robert Duncan, like I do. I think he was on that syllabus of yours. Place of first permission. You know, right. often I am permitted to return to a meadow, and at the end, place of first permission. And Emily Dickinson said that in a letter to a friend of hers, Eden is always eligible, which is just, you know, I mean that's. And if you, if we lose track in ourselves of that primordial place, that possibility of something Edenic, however fleeting or limited, and a lot of people look at Francis Landy, the great theologian, um, sees, you know, Song of Song is in fact a kind of reflection of the possibility of Eden as projected out into, into the future as an option through love, but whatever that love is, however it's understood allegorically or 
slant, as Dickinson would say. Um, so these things rise up. Um, this particular song, this particular poem was the product I was asked to do a libretto with the um, composer Aaron J. Kernis. And we just talked about what do we, what's on our minds, what do we think is urgent, and we were talking about gardens and obviously sort of climate crisis and change and um, and so I just I just sort of map an area and just start thinking about it for a long time and you know as soon as you draw a frame around something then everything that comes in the frame starts to, to relate to what you're thinking about and reading a ton and reading a lot of Kabbalistic things um, and this emerged. Uh, at the beginning of the of the lockdown, so two and a half years ago, um, my wife and I were walking out towards the Long Island Sound. We, you know, we live in New Haven, but near the near the near the harbor, and we just took a really really long walk way out, and just the kind of exposure and the openness and the horizon, the kind of Agnes Martin bareness there, yeah. and and I just felt this this poem coming up. In you know, welling up inside me in that way, and that's the way that usually the good things happen. A fragment you hear uh, the beginning of something, something you had written in your notebook, something you had read, something somebody said, and you get a rhythm, and then you just started staying with it and staying with it, and this is this is what gradually develops. The words give birth to each other, and. I want to hear some, some more poems, but just one other thing that comes to mind is, so we're talking about this thing that's primordial, but um, the anagrammatical quality of, of what you're doing here also suggests that it's very um, precarious and reversible, you know, almost, where, you know, things fall apart in different ways. And um, you get the sense that it could almost be otherwise uh, so often. And that's just an interesting attribute to add. You know, I'm thinking spiritually and theologically, of course, in, ter in terms of what this suggests about our appreciation of existence, you know, that we can get so primordial, but then also we have a sense of it being so fragile. Um, Absolutely, um, well, yeah. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great way, great observation. I mean, that's the tend and attend in the sense of it's a fragile poem here. Um, but in general, yeah, that things are this way, now they can be that way. You've got those letters on the wall behind you I was looking at before, right? You can rear They can be endlessly rearranged and they can fall off the wall. I have a poem, Letters Falling Off the Wall, 40 years ago I wrote it. Um, uh, there's also a sense, though, of something primordial can also be something messianic or future-oriented. And um, Berkeley's own Danny Matt, you probably all know of Daniel Matt, who translated the Zohar, um, and is one of the great commentators himself on it, really. Um, he likes to translate the, the notion of the world to come in the present um, participle, as a present participle, the world that is coming. And um, Abraham Abulafio, another one, another important Kabbalist, um, wrote that uh, life is the life of the world that is coming, which a man earns by means of the letters. So this constant permutation doing, making, and unmaking, and remaking of letters in combination is, in fact, for Abu Lafia, this kind of messianic world, which is also always eligible, he would say. I mean, he's the kind of radical in the, in the Jewish scheme, but it's, for poets, he's, he's dynamite. <laughs> uh, would you read us the next two poems? Yeah. Okay, so this is Vav. The, there's a whole series of poems in this book uh, about the Hebrew letters. Obviously, we've been talking about them, so it stands to reason. And what I wanted to do here was, um, well, I'll read the poem and then tell you. So it's for Jeffrey Hartman. I don't know how many of you know Jeffrey Hartman was. He was one of the great critics of the second half of the 20th century, literary critics. Uh, uh, Wordsworth, he also did a lot with rabbinic literature. Um, and I got to know him pretty well at the end of towards the end of his life when I came to New Haven. He was, he was already retired, but we spent a lot of time together. So this is called Vav, it's the sixth Hebrew letter uh, for Jeffrey Hartman in memoriam. This upright letter bows its head ever so slightly out of humility 
much like Geoffrey, toward the page it's fixed itself to, as though by a hook or being hooked, really a summoning from within it or a him, to listen hard to what's barely there and maybe not quite yet between the lines, to sit taking a stand and read, learning straightness and when to bend. So we come not to the end, but once again and again to end. Um, should I read the next one, Nate, or you want to say something, talk about this first, or? Um, but let's let's hear one more first. Yeah, yeah. So this one's quite different. What the beard said back to more more kind of Kabbalistic land in in, in Kabbalah. There's a there's a notion of smallness of mind versus sort of largeness, greatness of mind. And I was just playing with those phrases. They really struck me because. Also, small and great can mean different things, right? Small can be beautiful, and small can be small-mindedness, and all that. So, what? The, and I also was thinking about, you know, the notion of religiosity and the beard and authority. And the Middle Ages is full. Uh, there's also a lot of poems in Hebrew about making fun of people with their beards. What kind of creatures are living in them? Like the beard, is, instead of being a sign of piety, it's almost a sign of a fraud, right? It's a, a mask. Um, so all that's in the background. And of course, then there's a Christian text, right? The Gnostic text, what the cloud said, what the thunder said, right? What the beard said. Smallness of mind, the xenophobic mystic muttered his beard a cloud, a little too proud, I thought, hearing. Smallness of mind. It's what makes us miss the greatness of straits opening on to a faintness, call it largesse, of first things, traces, linking long, trails of being, tales of longing, marrow in the narrow bone of our rendered listening, low today for instant skies, the winter tint of tarnished vintage silver in a kitchen drawer. Drawings goyish, said the cloud, though you love it. Over paths, you're always walking wherever you are when you're able. Spokes poking out from the crown of cones or corners you've never seen but seem to turn within, within you. Time and again, misanthropy's end. The cloud sputtered. Smallness of mind. Magnitude's friend. I have no idea how that one happened. But, um, yeah. So one of the things we're getting at here is that Draw Me After in this book is not just from the Song of Songs. I've been working with a lot of artists um, and their drawings. And literally, what is, what, what, what is that fascination with drawing and being drawn? Um, this is actually a poem about walking around Worcester Square Park, which you know pretty well, Nate, in, in New Haven. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I want to hear more about that drawings goyish, right? So it's su suggesting, at least in the mystic's perspective, or I guess the cloud's perspective, you know, that it's something to be to be avoided or or not not ideal. Um, where does that come from? Yeah. So that's one of those, you know, donays. I have no idea how that popped into the poem, but, and I sort of didn't want to say it, but of course then I, that's the sign you have to say it. Um, I guess it was, the, I guess behind it, thinking back now is the sense of representation. It's a, that, that old struggle of yeah. mimetic art, abstract art. I mean, I don't think of abstract art as abstract, as you'll see in a second. I think it is very concrete, but representation can can what we do complete be perfect in its replication in its imitation and the sense in a kind of real theological sense and it certainly runs through jewish things that it can never be complete art always has to factor in incompletion and sort of human frailty and human partiality and all that and um so drawing in the conventional sense of portraiture and um, I can capture that, I can capture you. And um, maybe that's what that means at some level. I don't really know what it means. Um, but uh, but it was good. For, it popped out. And I have to admit that I love it. You know, I just absolutely love it. 
and I'm writing about all these these another kind of line of thought, but but that I do love it. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah and also, the thing about this poem that interests me is that, you know, it starts with a kind of rabbinic dismissal of smallness of mind, but by following out the th what that means, smallness of mind, or where it leads me, it ends up with smallness lead uh, through syllabics and l concentration on the small. The minute particulars, as Blake said, labor well. The minute particulars uh, of language, you end up at magnitude, and a kind of vision that is more encompassing. Yeah, it strikes me as a sort of ars poetica. Um, it could be. Um, well, want to see some drawings? Yeah, let's see some drawings. Then, then, then we'll talk a little more. Okay. Um, so this is from a, a series in the middle of the book called On Being Drawn uh, for the artist Terry Winters. You can see behind me, there's some prints on the wall. Those are all by Terry. I did another book with him, this one poem, uh, kind of limited uh, fine press book. And he's just an artist I've been really drawn to, and uh, we've become good friends. And uh, so this is one of the, the poems in the series is to this. He asked me to write something um, for a show of his at the Drawing Center in New York a few years ago. And so I just lived with a bunch of his drawings and reproductions of them for a while, and, and poems emerged. Um, so I just stared at that for quite a long time and began writing all kinds of things, and who knows I, what I, you know, threw out all kinds of stuff. And then I ended up with this poem. So just so you can all see it one more time, right? There is a score to all that isn't said, a constant buzzer hum enlarged, a pulse that soon becomes like something sung or spoken within. There is a string, no, there are wavering violins. We bring attention like a wish, a wind along a wall or laundry line and clothespins marking time with keys shifting through an unquaint calm. And now a chaos of tangled thinkings twine in a drawer, a silent roar. The world is bound by secret knots, they say. The what that means is hard to know and flickers so also and really are those knots a noose that hangs or ties that bind or being stuck or held together like a bridge to build and cross or maybe draw on or up so no one can? There is a score to all that. I think one of the things that's happening in a poem like this, um, Nate, is that when you talked about that precarity, that it can all be undone. So I, I think of these poems as a kind of poetics of, in linguistics, they call it the garden path. You're, seeing, you're going one direction, and then suddenly it veers off in another direction, and then another direction. And language is always being short-circuited, but it does add up to something. It's not like language poetry in which it's just being short-circuited. It's like there is a whole that's being, being followed yeah. out often something can become its opposite very quickly. Mm -hmm. And like the, the drawing and the language contains all these possibilities within it, this kind of music that's um, unspoken or beneath what it is we speak. Um, yeah, it was interesting to me to see these poems. Um, I mean, I think your, your book in general uses all sorts of forms and you've always done that, um, but to see a little less punctuation and a little more kind of, I don't even know the right word for it, but there's a sense, like you were saying, a, a spilling over, allowing a phrase to refer to something right behind it syntactically and then just ahead of it as well. Um, which of course reminds me of drawing in the way that, you know, lines kind of move. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, I wanna talk about ekphrastic writing, um, but do you wanna read do you want to read the, the other two of these first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the next one um, is based on this drawing. It's got a little bit of color in it, uh, yellow pencil. So you can just stare into that and get a sense of it. And um, this one brings us back to the topic for today. Six. This writing's on and off the wall. 
and tells us what it is and why we're so intent on understanding a layered saying that seems to say it all and nothing in particular, just like everything seen by those who know it shows at best the whole in part that grows with the telling and spell dangling in between, like someone listening into a certain sort of uncertainty, speaking of uncertainty as a song of songs, tangled truly in our being led along, a luminous line singed and fringed within the singing seeing, seeing us through. And then the last drawing poem is this, much more We're lucky we now own some of these drawings. They're in our living room. They're really incredible things, creatures to live with. Um, so there's this one. In arc so dark, it glows with its holding the nothing it knows within its unfolding. Composes now a hardening sparks unhidden power, unbidden black in diamond white as softening graphite crystal flaking gently breaks into an opaque night of fluorescence over a field behind a fence where a king's thinking of slipping tenses and the ancient art of riding wakes or maybe only a day's mistakes here at the pointed end of a pencil from a parcel and that's a start as ink shines in the king's heart. That so last you, one is so different. I was just gonna yeah. say that this last one is so different and the drawing is so different. Um, but yeah, the, the darkness really appealed um, in a, a sense of of going into blackness, going into a kind of darkness or bleakness, but really going into it, going into it so far that it does actually begin to shine and you do go, you move through it. And if you don't actually go into it, you will never get out of it. That's mm -hmm. some of the things I'm seeing in here and, and, and psychologically it, uh, was written at a moment of some crisis of my own. Um, but yeah, different. Um, I was, what, what you said though about the openness, the lack of punctuation, yeah, that's a, a lot of this book has that as, as you've seen. And um, it, is, it has to do with that. There's a lot of um, kind of trusting in this book of just the letters will show me what to do. And I'm controlling as I'm trying to keep control to it. I mean, compositionally, I want to control, obviously I want, I yeah. want to, it's a kind of controlled openness, but um, I'm trying to interfere as little as possible with uh, that sort of desire of the letters. Yeah, it's funny. I've the new I hadn't written for a while since my last book came out, and then I've just recently started again, and it's all been unpunctuated mostly, and it it feels so generative, um, and you you just have more of a sense of like making verses that you can walk around with in your head almost. Um, that sort of just carving, really carving sound into space. Um, that's yeah. what it's helped me kind of uh, come back to. Um, yeah. But I, yeah. Think, I think there's also something in the air of, you know, there's a sense of the things are, I mean, there's always a sense that things are falling apart and coming together and falling apart. But last couple of years, it's, yeah pretty tangible and so this sense of like words and letters in suspension in space seems to suit the moment um, mm -hmm. for me so i know in your uh your beautiful little book that you did with terry you wrote a little bit about the relationship between ekphrastic writing writing about art and translation um, but i think it'd be really interesting for us to to hear some of that um that process, I mean, I haven't, I haven't done any really ekphrastic writing, but they seem so different, right? The idea of, of working from, lang from language into language, 
versus you know from from artistic materials um, into language that that ekphrastic writing seems like it would require so much more um, so much more of you in the middle um, kind of inventing um, um, you know making decisions I guess um, but but it didn't sound like that's been the case well first of all in, in literary translation uh, John Denham the poet said something like uh, I'm gonna I'm not even going to try to quote this one. I'm just going to like give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, but that in in moving a spirit of a poem from one language to another, that, that spirit is so volatile, like spirits, like liquids, that if you don't add, if the translator or the poet translating doesn't add something of himself to the mix to stabilize it in the transfer, all you'll end up with is a caput mortem, a kind of dead head of material, and the rest will, the, the essence will, you know, evaporate. Um, so, you know, in translation, you need to, yeah. artfully, there's, there is that need to, to add and to know how much and all that. Um, because I, over the years, I really have come to see writing poetry generally one's own poetry as a kind of translation in the sense of it just that everybody else doesn't know what the original is. In fact, you might not even know what the original is. And that's maybe what being a poet is, is, or writing, discovering a poem is, coming across a poem is, ah, you say, ah, here's the original. Now I know what to translate. Or you write in order to find out where the original is, which is also a kind of liberating um, thing. And, um, and that, gives a, that gave me a lot of pleasure uh, when I began writing poems that way, um, the same pleasure I took from translating. And, and then I realized at a certain point, hmm, you know, when Terry asked me to write these and another artist, Joel Shapiro, a sculptor had asked me to, and a wood printer, uh, asked me to do some things. I realized this is the same process. It's, I'm reading, what is a trans, a verbal translation is, you're, it's a very, close physical reading of a surface it's just identifying a poem as a surface not just as ideas or um, but, but really getting into that surface its rhythms its textures and accounting for those as much as for what it's quote saying right so the same with with these visual works um it was a, a kind of experiment i wanted to just sort of feel my way into them and see if I could account for the textures and the rhythms and the compositional choreography um, that I'm seeing on the page. I mean, in a way, people can have a lot more of a common experience. We can all talk about what we're seeing on the screen, probably see a lot more, of, we'll all see the same, more of the same thing, even though this is sort of abstract, than if we read a poem. If you read a poem, right everybody's all over the place um here we could if somebody described it for you you you'd spot it on a wall with other things um so i'm trying to account for that that sort of sensual experience of, of the drawing of the, of the ink of the the spaces and um see what words they'll give birth to just trying to like not so much not just give a narrative version of what I'm seeing, where there's some of that too, but can I get the, the rhythms of my mind moving through, my eyes moving through this, these drawings? Can I get something about their textures and their play? And like the, the Song of Songs one, the twine, world within world, is, is this a mess or is this a cosmos? You know, a cosmos. Um, and, just trying to account for that. There was, as you said, it was play. It, it was play. It was experiment. It's recreation. It's recreation. It's what's inside this box. What's inside the Song of Songs? Oh, it turns out, says the rabbis, all these letters um, looking for each other on the mountains. Same kind of thing here. Um, so it was. It was an experiment to see how how far I could push that. What would come of it? Would they stand alone as poems? Um, 
Uh, I think most of them do. They at least so far seem to. Uh, in any case, I'm printing them in the book with some, not all the illustrated, not all the drawings, just a few. Um, but I also want it as that kind of relationality. Um, so much of poetry for me is about a relationality, whether it's with a, a, another translated text or other people or other realities that are in front of us, visual or um, or spiritual, and in this case, um, a drawing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have that line somewhere as if living itself were an end endless translation. Right. Um, right. And I, I believe that. I really yeah. I feel that deeply. Yeah. William Carlos Williams had that thing of, well, what is the, what is the poet's job? The poet's job is to um, make the necessary translations. Um, and that, yeah, that that kind of makes me wonder. Um, I'm curious when you feel like ekphrasis or translation fail when it fails. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, was that kind of the same feeling um, in in writing after these drawings as you've had in translating poets? Um, did you feel like you were kind of learning this the same lessons? And and I mean, do you do you do you have translations that you just haven't been able to finish yet? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially when I'm working on big anthologies, the things I just just some I can't put them in there because they're not alive. They just, you know, the words are there, but they're they're not alive as poems in English, and and so they would misrepresent the original. I mean, basically, I don't like ekphrastic poetry, right? Like a lot of people, it's like ekphrastic because again, it's like Song of Songs, joke number twelve. Uh, we, if you've got the painting, why do we need a, uh, what do we need a poem about it? Like, what? You're not inspired? Think of your own poems. So I. That's why I'm trying not just to like. This is not a com This is not a commentary on the poem. This is. These are just works that are sort of inspired and in dialogue with these things. But they're their own things. Uh, and the failed ones would be ones where they just don't come alive. I tried something and it didn't happen. And for whatever reason, I wasn't alert then, or that drawing didn't speak to me, or it could be any number of things. Um, obviously there's a lot of subjectivity with also with translations, even with translations that some people would say are, are great, are immortal. Right. You like, you like one Aeneid, I like a different Aeneid and, um, but still there, um, it's my, sort of my own sense of what's coming alive and whether it just let it go because also those impulses, they come back around, it'll show up somewhere else. You know, also part of that trusting that um yeah yeah and this conversation right as opposed to yeah I, mean, that, that, I think that's that conversational relational dimension is really central to this book and really becomes even more central as my poetry has developed over the years it's become much more central and it was there but in a way that i don't think i was conscious of and didn't acknowledge and and mm -hmm. so it's kind of a, a new pleasure to push it and see where mm -hmm. it goes, where it takes me, you know, where it draws me. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And that's one thing I love about the Song of Songs, right, is that it's a conversation. Um, it's a dialogue, which which really makes it stand. I mean, it stands out from the rest of of Scripture in other ways, too. But the fact that it's that is this dialogue um, as opposed to a narrative, say, um, right. Right, and in the Hebrew, the the sort of sensual qualities of the language, the kind of playing that I've been talking about, is very thick, and so you feel that it's not just a dialogue between the people or the yeah. personages in the in Song of Songs, but it is very much a dialogue uh, of the letters themselves, um, and that, that that's a kind of mimesis versus abstraction. In other words, the structure, what you're just getting at, the structure of Song of Songs is one of the most beautiful things about it, apart from what they're actually saying. Um, and, you know, the, the classic Jewish thing is Rabbi Akiva, when they're arguing, and the rabbis are arguing, should the Song of Songs even be in the Bible? Should it be one yeah. part of the canon? Yeah. 
and he comes along and says, you know, um, you know all the writings in the Bible are, are holy, but this is the holy of holies. And this is basically equivalent to, because everything is in it, and all possibility, and without that kind of desire and coupling, nothing exists. Um, so. um. Let's let's maybe uh, come towards our conclusion, Peter, by by hearing a, a few more from that last group of poems. I think we have time at least for for two more. What do you think? Should we do uh, one or two or? Yeah, well, I I, I loved um, I loved Tet if that's how you said it. And um... mm -hmm. all right, we read read Tet. Tet's a very different kind of poem. Um, you talked about uh, Nate. You talked about the letters coming together and also containing seeds of violence. And so, in this case, um, the letter Tet. When I would start writing these, uh, I consider these ekphrastic poems too. I'm taking a letter. Sometimes I'm commenting on the shape, uh, but sometimes not. Sometimes I'm just commenting on like I'll have an association and just play with it and see where it goes. So that. Um, You'll see, I think it's self-explanatory. Tet. Tet is the ninth letter, but it doesn't, this has nothing to do with nine. Tet. That God and good, as English words rub elbows, shoulders, and though less likely, far more private parts is something oddly absent, and at once a given in the almost always resonant scriptures Hebrew, since the deity there, curiously plural in its inflection, meaning more or less universal, saw what he'd done and said it was just that, good, tov, as when one's mazel is, call it fortune. For example, this persimmon in its bowl, curve within curve and amber flesh like a melon's in an ochre skin, slightly bruised near mandarin, oranges set beside the window, rain slanting past the pane, a warplane roaring overhead through December, Chinese masters and then Persian often drew them, which is to say drew them in through it all, war and famine, exile, shame, voids and ink stains, clearly fine if less a given than a gift made more vivid strangely by the early morning papers news from a foreign country come so much it did my heart inflame Aleppo crushed the flight begun again in scores of thousands hung not as though between lives alone but over nothing at all or maybe worse Please do not destroy there are things here your children might be able to use what a great victory. That used to be a street. These were homes. This is how it's happening now. You see a bomb falling from the sky. You wait and close your eyes, waiting to die or realize you're still alive. This is the feeling inside you, she said, in Aleppo. Good God. Maybe I'll read one more and then uh, the short. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say, Peter, yeah. um, just want to make a connection to the gallery show. Um, yeah. um, there, there's three really powerful kind of interpretations of the Song of Songs, but this poem really connects with the installation by um, Shirin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sh Shirin. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was looking at that. And also her Gaza, the, the um, flashes, and yeah, this very much. Like from all that goodness, out comes something a lot less good. And, and she had this quote, a song of bombs exploding. Um, and mm. yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think it's so hard to write with with the political, you know, just right there without without coming across as as I don't know, preachy. Maybe that's my problem, but but uh, or without sort of saying what everyone already expects to hear um but the way you weave it in here you know was so surprising to me the first time i read it um because it starts out in a, as a totally different poem um so. right and it was totally surprising to me i right, right, had right. zero idea where this was going to go and um i mean the war planes overhead were war planes in jerusalem i heard those war planes this yeah. was the news the uh, from a you know um what's the line from the news from a foreign country come you probably recognize is um, Traherne or Vaughn? I now I'm forgetting. Um, 
but it, it's in the newspaper, but it's in the metaphysical poets also. Um, yeah, and these things just sort of came together. The letters, in a way, sort of just led me to them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, which one do you want to end with? I, I love So the Days, but... but... Yeah, let, let's end with that. It's very much a uh, another lockdown poem. Um, maybe wrote it last year, I think, uh, Walking Around the Neighborhood, So the Days. So this is a kind of mask, living our lives behind masks. So the days. So the grayish gauzy days lower and lift across this slit like a shift. The sky wore out its welcome mat and whether or not it matters more and more within me masked, everything fraying at what seems to be or will it really is ringing us in. It's silvery lingering white through dark over the park or parking lots of time and blood on our hands. Once again, the eyes have it. Listen, yes, that gray in-betweenness of this gauze and gorgeously bandaged day. That's a beautiful poem. Um, Peter, thank you so much. Um, thank really you. Really have, have enjoyed this. Um, I, I've been told there's uh, maybe one or two questions from the audience. So do you want to unshare your screen and we'll get to see everybody again? And if, if there's time, um, if anybody does have a question, uh, enter it in the chat if you want, or just raise your hand, that might be better. Am I missing someone? Lydia, did you have a, did you say someone had a question? Elizabeth. It looks like I see a hand right there, Elizabeth. Well, uh, I don't really have a question, but I'll just get things going because I think other people might have questions. I just want to thank you so much. I really am sort of feeling a little overwhelmed, as my grandfather used to say, by, by, by everything and um, thinking about the letters, which is something I hadn't thought of before is so, um, you know, it's both powerful and, and fun at the same time. Um, so I'm really um, enjoying thinking about that and about the, the conversation that you had. I'm also thinking about our, the next exhibition that we're doing, which is a, a series of prints by three different artists. Um, one of the artists had um, a poet who wrote, who wrote poems about her work that we're including um, in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So it's just something like linking, you know, your discussion of linking the visual, the drawings and the, and the poems is something that is, we've been thinking about a lot lately and what that means and your process of creating a poem. Also, we interviewed the artists for our next show and their artistic process sounds very similar you know, to what you're describing. So it's just, I'm just, mm -hmm. just thinking, I'm sort of filled with thinking about a lot of those things yeah. right now. I liked your overhelm. There's, you know, in, in uh, the Eastern European um, Jewish tradition, there's the, the helm story is the kind of almost sort of like holy fools or just fools. Right. I think they I'm now going to use overhelmed. I'm overhelmed. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question for Peter or a thought to share before we wrap up? Uh, Arthur, yes, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks. Just uh, This has been wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, You're welcome. I just started thinking about the, the Song of Songs as, as a, a pictorial art in a way that how much of the Song of Songs, when you think about it, is descriptive there's, it's not so much narrative. I mean, there, there are things happening, but you can't, it's impossible to make a real, you know, coherent narrative out of it. It's just, they're flashes of pictures mm -hmm. and how much of it is just describing, as we talked about it in an earlier session uh, that Olivia was uh, leading us through, descriptions of body parts or descriptions of geography. And so it's a, there's a nice kind of coming around full circle with this, that to, to think of poetry reflecting on the art that reflects poetry itself and this kind of um, entanglement has been uh, 
very stimulating. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And also the fact that, as you say, we don't really know what the song of this of song is all about, or how it's supposed to come together, if it comes together, and 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 that sort of tangle of possibilities is what one of the things that's been so resonant and rich in it. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. I joined somewhat late in the middle. Um, I'm Sephra. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us today. I um, also had a question, but just another observation. Listening to your final two poems, I was struck by the presence of this experience of sheltering in them. Um, one in a context that is, you might say, one type of warfare. Um, and in the experience of pandemic, another type of trauma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, sort of global combative experience. And shelter, of course, and seeking shelter is a trope that is very much woven into both of those. But also listening to you read them, part of what it brought to the fore for me is that in, in words and also in the arts more broadly, but in your words, in these words, particularly in this, in this instance, we also find shelter, a type of emotional and spiritual shelter in making our way through these experiences. And I don't know that that had really dawned on me before in quite that way. And I just wanna thank you for extending that type of shelter to all of us um, and sharing. I think it goes back to, um something that we talked about at the very beginning, which is this notion of Emily Dickinson's that Eden is always eligible and that um, that kind of primordial experience of a certain unity and garden is something that, that is related to song mm -hmm. and, and to being carried in that sense. And also, um, you can't live without some of it. Like you may be, violence may be, violence of all kinds locks us out of it. Mm -hmm. And you're never restored to it in more than a flash. Mm -hmm. But but it is always available. And, and even if it's just the possibility of it, you know, that, that's very difficult to live without. Mm -hmm. And so that's an interest, it's really interesting comment on both of those poems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I encourage everybody to to look for Peter's book. Um, in fact, look for his his previous books if you don't have them already. Um, but the new book, Draw Me After, is out. Uh, which month, Peter? Is it November? November. November. Yeah. This coming November. Um, I love talking with you. It's uh, such Thank a gift. Guys. Thank you so much for sharing your work and for sharing your time. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure.